It is a joy to be with you this rainy, rainy Wednesday. How are we doing? I'm doing great because I'm about to talk to you all about my favorite books of 2022. I have been in a different place for this yearly roundup of my favorite books all three years in a row now. Like I've been <laughs> in a different apartment this year in a different city. I don't know where I'm going to be next year, but um, books are the things that play a large part in keeping me sane, happy, and the person I am. So it's, yeah, it's just a wild ride to look back and see the books that have impacted me. I don't have a set number every year. It's just like, I, I just know which ones make the cut onto this list. I think this year I have about 12 or 13. So we're going to go through them, counting up to my number one best book of the year. This year is a slight draw as opposed to last year where I had like three tying for the number one place, but this year it's like kind of between two, more leaning towards one. This year I got to read 141 books, which is maybe the best I've done in a few years. I'm really happy with that. I found so many new, good, amazing books. Uh, a lot. I want to say most, almost, yeah, most of the books on this list are from my Reading Around the World challenge, which means that literature from around the world just really works for me. I love learning new things. I love experiencing different countries' writing. Without further ado, here are my best books. Also, please leave yours in the description box. Please leave your best book below. Coming in at number 13 is a nonfiction. I'm really excited to have a nonfiction on here. I want to read a lot more nonfiction in the new year, and that is The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. I heard about this on booktube, and you guys know I've been going through it. I've been going through some stuff for a while regarding brain injuries and more specifically concussion and PTSD relating to brain injury and all of that stuff. And at the start of 2022, I made it my goal to just learn more about it, to educate myself more, especially educate myself on trauma and anxiety. So reading The Body Keeps the Score was not always a comfortable experience. Sometimes I could feel my heart racing while I read this because this is a study on like the brain, the mind, and the body and the healing of trauma. This was so needed for me because I really wanted a deeper scientific dive into, okay, what is my brain actually doing when I'm having a panic attack? Like what is actually happening? What are the neurological things that are going on? Um, and he really takes the time to explain all of it for you with like very helpful diagrams. As you can see, I took notes and then the second half of this book is kind of split into the real experiences of people um, including therapy, what worked for them, how they were able to get back to a healthier lifestyle. This really, really helped me. Uh, it was a lot. This took me a really long time to read. Overall, I'm really grateful to this book because it let me learn a lot about uh, myself. I would recommend, but I'd recommend taking it really slowly because it can be um, a lot. Uh, my goal is to definitely read more books like that this year. I actually have one checked out right now on like it's called The Anatomy of Anxiety. I'm gonna be starting that probably in a couple of days, but this was just this was just something really good for me. So it has to make it on this list as having a lasting positive effect on myself. Now the rest of this is just good old fiction. Number 12, I read this very early on. Um, number 12 is the posthumous memoirs of Varas Kubas by Machado de Assis. This Oh man, it's just, it's hard not to fall in love with this book. It's so hard. This book is like a charming, charming person walking by, telling things to you in like a very polite, funny, engaging, charming way, and you can't help but speak back to them, engage with them, and have a conversation about life. This was a gift from Lucas. Thank you so much because I love this. It's about a dead aristocrat and um, he's penning his memoir for the worms as he calls it, but this is also a very performative book because it looks at society a lot and even though he says, even though our writer says that he's writing his memoir for the worms, he's really not. It's, it's a book that's so self-conscious. The author has so much fun poking fun at both society, himself, books in general, like how books are written, authors. It's a really interesting commentary really early on. This is a piece of Brazilian literature, fantastic. It's funny, it's so quotable, it gets at both the very silly, not very serious things of life, but then the next chapter it delves into like, why are we alive? Why the heck are we here? It does all that so seamlessly without ever missing a beat and it was just such an easy joy to read. The chapters are very short if you're looking for something that you could get through very easily. 
he just talks about his life when he was alive. He talks about maybe what death is like, what writing a book is like. So this one had to be on this list. Number 11 is A Wild Sheep Chase by Murakami. Uh, this year I started doing my like Murakami reading him in chronicle, chronolo chron him in chronological order. I only made it technically three books in, uh, but I'm so excited to continue reading more of his works this year. A Wild Sheep Chase was my favorite that I read in 2022. It's just, it's just great. It's so readable. Like whenever I'm in a reading slump, like picking up a Murakami will just do the trick for me. I don't know what it is about his work. It's so addictive, displays like everyday life, but then adds just a hint of magical realism or a hint of magic, especially in A Wild Sheep Chase, which is about this dude um, who works at like a printing company. And one day they print a pamphlet with this like very peaceful scenic picture of sheep grazing in a land just in a landscape you know they're eating some grass and this uber powerful man comes along and he's like you need to take that photo down or we're gonna ruin your life and then they loop our protagonist into also going on a wild sheep chase to find this sheep in the photo which has huge ramifications ramifications um for the future for companies for japan it's just like it's crazy but it's so good i really like this murakami's use of the detective novel is something that's so interesting to me there aren't any real concrete definite answers in here um it makes you work really hard but then it rewards you with so many lovely passages of like let's go to a hotel bar and let's look at people let's take in nature let's eat some cool food it's just it's so good also i'm just i wish all books were this shiny it's just so magical and it, it, it really makes you want to be alive that's what it is for me it just it really makes me want to be alive and live life and get out there like a building is odd as if a great creature had grown old without being able to express its feelings not that it didn't know how to express them but rather that it didn't know what to express I don't know. So you follow him kind of losing it, looking for the sheep. So if you're new to Murakami, I think this is a great place to start. So that is a wild sheep chase. Okay, next up for me is an audiobook I listened to and now I really want to buy it and add it to my collection because it's one of those contemporary books that I'm finding I really enjoy. I don't really like as rule contemporary fiction when it's not centered on an examination of society, I guess. I'm kind of learning that like my my taste in contemporary fiction is books like Leave the World Behind by Ramana Lam, which focuses on issues like those. Books like this one, which is The Disaster Tourist by Yoon Ko Eun. This is amazing. This is a piece of South Korean literature and I ate this thing up. I ate this thing up. I've been wanting to read this for years. I've had it on like my wish list and then when I saw the audiobook, I was like, let's just go for it. It was pretty good, but like I said, I want to read it like for myself as well. It deals with tourism, uh, climate change again, huge corporations. We follow our protagonist who works at like a travel company in South Korea, but their travel company arranges trips for disaster zones. I mean, it's a thing right now. Lots of people go to places where disaster has occurred, whether it's natural or human-made, and they arrange trips for people to go and stay at these places, take a look around. It examines not only why do people do disaster tourism, but disaster tourism in this book is really just like the front for talking about tourism in general and how damaging it can be depending on how it's done, where it's done, who's doing it. So her company is pretty shady. She gets harassed. She gets sexually harassed at work and they just don't really take her seriously. They kind of throw her out the door to go on this mission or work trip to see if one of the packages that they offer is is still valuable and so she goes to this island off the coast of i think vietnam and she's there posing as a tourist but she's really trying to see if this is a valuable thing for people to spend their money on the features that this place has on display is like uh sinkholes i believe and it was also the site of a massacre a long time ago so she goes the local people put on like a kind of a show a reenactment of the massacre one day she accidentally gets lost in this town, she wanders outside of the safe zone for the tourists or the place where they're supposed to see it, and she accidentally sees a whole bunch of stuff that she's not supposed to see. And then it kind of cracks open wider conspiracies, wider things going on, shady dealings in the background, um, the sad reality of disaster tourism and tourism in general in the way that this book analyzes it. So good. Loved the ideas in here. It was horrific. It was so well done and it just kept unfolding like something you can't look away from um i just really really love books like these so disaster tourist 
The Disaster Tourist absolutely makes it um, this far down, so that is that one. Next up, it is The Ice Palace by Tari Vesos. I read this in, I think, January. Guys, guys, come on. I mean, look at this. Yes, please. This is a study about grief accompanied by a lot of symbolism for grief preserved in ice. Everything is preserved in ice. I love how the brain in the ice palace is treated like a frozen lake with a whole bunch of layers and like you have your consciousness, your subconsciousness. There's a really beautiful quote, really beautiful passage where like she's looking down into a frozen lake and she can see all of the different layers of things trapped in the ice and how things get, you know, a bit more melty close to the surface and how deep down it's all frozen solid. But this is set in Norway. It's a piece of Norwegian literature and we follow two girls who become very close have a very deep intimate connection very quickly and it's also centered around the ice palace which is a frozen waterfall that is a little bit beguiling dangerous beautiful and one day one of the girls goes missing into the frozen structure and she doesn't come back out and we follow the grief of one of the girls there's a lot of parallels there's a lot of beautiful lyricism literally anything looking at things in life through the guise of ice or snow or winter or that kind of imagery like i'm so there i think it's endlessly fascinating the ice palace took a few new turns that i haven't seen really done in other books before um specifically with like the waterfall structure and with light and ice which is really cool so that is that one. Then we have Things Fall Apart by Chinua Chebe. I read this at the same time with my partner, I think back in February. We really, really enjoyed this. Um, we still talk about it so much, like it's just hung on to us so much that I think like it, yeah, it just absolutely has to be on this list. This one I read for Nigeria for my Around the World Challenge, and this is about a Konkwo who is like the greatest warrior in his village, but one day he accidentally kills a clansman and that is not allowed. So he is outlawed, exiled, for a number of years and when he comes back he finds that things are very different because white people have arrived, missionaries have arrived, people who are changing the landscape, the population, and the people of Africa, Nigeria, and his village. So this was so interesting, so I think just so well told because you spend literally 80% of this book 80% of this book happens before you ever kind of get that inciting incident of him killing someone. So you get so immersed in everything. You learn so much about the day-to-day -day life um, to the point where when colonists eventually show up, the words like church literally slap you across the face because how quickly this book changes as well, like the last few pages, devastating. I think you read the last page and it just, it changes the whole story. It makes you want to read it again um, and yeah really really enjoyed this i really recommend this next up we have a diet's the blind owl oof oof this is so good this is a gift this is a gift thank you so much um wow 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 this is a book that i don't really want to explain to you because it's first of all it's really hard to explain i'm not gonna lie um but this is a very dark disturbing book it plays so much on um the theme of like motifs and patterns in both our lives, our dreams, in novels themselves. It follows this man who's very sick. Um, he may or may not be a murderer. He's kind of shut up in his home. It also deals in very unsettling ways with like, how much am I my own person? When do I start to bleed into someone else? The way it's done in The Blind Owl is like, horrifying it bridges the landscape of dreams with like the ground of reality and it's like very hard to know what is going on this deserves several hundred rereads um the writing is gorgeous extremely unsettling it just left me feeling so like a curled little ball of darkness in the corner of my room all of these faces were inside of and belonged to me scary funny and criminal masks that could change with a snap of the finger i had seen all of these in myself as though their reflection was inside of me all of these faces were within me, yet none belonged to me. It was just one- this is one of the most disturbing books I've ever read for sure. Um, I think- I'm pretty sure I gave this five stars and I just- I really cannot wait to read it again. Then we have quite a special book and this one makes it so high up the list because of its writing. Wow, gorgeous, 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 gorgeous writing. I fell in love with this and this is even more special to me because I just found it randomly on a bookshelf in a bookstore in Iceland. Um, and here it is, it's now in my home. Uh, it's Heaven and Hell by Jan Coleman Stephenson. This is so good. 
Oh, it just smells amazing. This just means the absolute world to me now. Writing is the thing that absolutely made this book. Hi. What do you have? Did you bring me your feather? Uh, <laughs> thank you. That's so kind. Do you want it? Hi. Oh, hi. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the video. <laughs> you can have it. Okay. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. No, that's the microphone. Okay. Okay, thank you for joining. Go get it. Go get it. That was a very special gift you brought me. Thank you so much. So, okay. Cool. Um, this is gorgeous. The premise... <laughs> so distracting. The premise is that we have two um, kind of young boys. They're friends. Um, they're really good friends. And they go fishing out in the sea to bring back cod. This is set in like 1888, I think. And this book explores grief so much. It's just so gorgeous. One of them was obsessed with poetry and reading, which wasn't really encouraged by anyone um, where they were. And he was obsessed with Paradise Lost. And so the other one decides that he's going to take Paradise Lost back to an old sea captain and you follow him like on his journey, what happens to him, uh, his grief, but the writing in this just made it something otherworldly. Honestly, like I was reading it in the airport and then I would get to a line and it would just, it's the kind of book that like literally makes you stop look up, look around, it takes your breath away, it shifts something inside of you into a new position, it helps maybe settle something of your own grief or just the way you see the world or your appreciation for language and like what it can do is just truly extraordinary. It's also narrated by the dead, which is just such an interesting other little kernel that makes this book so unique. It's also a trilogy, which I didn't know when I picked it up. It's written like this as well, so it took me a long time to read because there's not really that much break for dialogue. Um, the front calls it a long breath from the depths of the sea, and that's that's really what it feels like because it's just kind of written like that. The sentences are so long. It just it just worked in every single in every single way. The book smelling so much of medicine that we are cured and freed from ailments simply by catching a whiff of them. Tell me it's not healthy to read books. It really plays on heaven and hell. It plays with ideas from Paradise Lost and it's just really, really impressive and like a breath of fresh air, honestly, this book because it just, it just felt so different. So that is heaven and hell. Then we have a huge surprise because I wasn't, I wasn't really planning on enjoying Interview with the Vampire as much as I did. So this makes it to number five, I think. We're getting down to the top five. This was so good. What the actual heck? Wow. Favorite vampire book now? I think, hands down. Again, the writing, gorgeous. Um, I had seen the movie a couple of times. Oh, that's where that went. I'd seen the movie a couple of times. Love the movie. The book was even better, even though the movie is phenomenal right? This follows Louis and he's turned into a vampire and you follow him go throughout his life all the way until the 1980s in San Francisco and he's kind of like, why? Why am I a vampire? So much of this book is a vampire story disguised. It's just disguised as a vampire story. Um, it's more a story about why are we alive? Why the hell are we here? You know? And that's a big question to be asking on 3.15 p.m. on a Wednesday afternoon, but this is like, why do we exist? What is our relationship to death? Like, where does everyone go when they die? Um, what is our relationship to, like, religion, morality, spirituality? But it's all asked through the eyes of a vampire, which makes it just so much more because, of course, Louis is going to live forever and he's trying so desperately to find these answers that more often than not are actually hidden from him because Lestat, who turned him into a vampire, is his very... Oh man, he's just such a cool character. Uh, his very prickly companion, let's say, and they together inadvertently, accidentally, but also purposefully and meticulously turn this young five-year-old girl named Claudia into a vampire as well, and then they kind of become dads to this five-year-old vampire, which ends, you know, which goes about as well as you think it would go, um, to have a child vampire who's absolutely terrifying and people think she's a cute little doll, but she can, like, snap your neck. This was just so cool, so cool. It changed it just like changed the whole myth of the vampire and my whole interest in vampires because I just think nothing has done it like this. I now have the next two books in the series on my shelf, so cannot wait. The relationships, 
the writing, the philosophy, the conversations. My favorite thing, one of my favorite things is when people have such good conversations in books. Like I love following people's dialogue as they parse something out together and interview with the vampire did that so many times. I cannot tell you my love for this book and so compulsively readable. So highly, highly recommend Interview with the Vampire. Now we have a book that I have mentioned before in this video actually, and that is Paradise Lost by John Milton. Um, I have read this, not all of it before, and that's why it's on the 2022 list because I've never sat down and read Paradise Lost front to back, but this year I did for um, my clothes, clothes off of my Renaissance lit course, which I finished in um, April. Is that right? I think I finished it in April, but I had to read all of Paradise Lost and man, what a true, what a true delight, honestly. Um, if you've never heard of this poem by John Milton, it's an epic poem detailing kind of a few lines in the book of Genesis where the earth is created, Adam and Eve are created, and then they fall from the Garden of Eden. However, it also details hell and heaven, like what's going on in those places. It details Satan's fall from heaven, um, him setting up his little city with his homeboys. We have God in heaven kind of just being like, ah, that kind of sucks, but we'll deal with it. And then we have Adam and Eve. Adam, who's just kind of a bumbling idiot. And then Eve, who's really interesting. Satan, who's really interesting. Gorgeously written. So much of everything in this book. So impressive. Um, so many beautiful lines that I want tattooed on my brain for forever. Just like to read this out loud in the middle of whatever you're doing or read it with someone is incredible because the words, man, the words, like that's what heaven and hell I think draws so much inspiration from is paradise lost. They try to do the same thing with just like the sound, the absolute power of words, like here in the heart of hell to work in fire or to do his errands in the gloomy deep. While ruling heaven left him at large to his own dark designs that with reiterated crimes he might heap on himself damnation. But yeah, anyway, I've studied this so many times at uni now and even though my degree is now done, I know my work with this book is probably not done. Um, so five huge stars. I'm so glad I got the opportunity to read this whole thing this year. We finally arrived at the top three. I'm just like so sad. I don't know why I'm so sad about this. I'm like so happy. Coming in in the number three spot is Pedro Paramo by Juan Rufo. Thank you so much. This is a gift from Jerry. I loved this. Holy moly. Mexican lit. The piece of Mexican literature I've picked up has been, I think, five stars. All of it. This checks out 100% because this is one of Gabriel Garcia Marquez's favorite books. I think he had it memorized at one point. And so 100 Years of Solitude, which is one of my favorite books, um, draws a lot of inspiration from this. This works so much, again, with memory, with layering different things, different voices on top of each other. It works a lot with like voice work because we have different characters just talking over one another. Sometimes you kind of have to parse out who is actually saying what. The story begins when um, our young man leaves his dead mother and goes out on a journey to find the town where his father lives to kind of curse his father, get back at him for leaving him and his mother alone. So he finds the town, but uh, does he find his father? It's a desolate wasteland. Um, things look very different than he was told that they would look. And he does find people, but he finds them like individually. He'll talk to them and then he'll kind of turn around and they'll be gone. So this story takes a very like spiraling approach um, to history, to trauma, to memory. Um, it looks at what happened in this town for it to get as bad as it did and the fact that like things can't be really laid to rest when such horrors occur it looks at like generational trauma um and it did so in the space of like under like 100 pages nights around here are filled with ghosts you should see all the spirits walking through the streets as soon as it's dark they begin to come out no one likes to see them there's so many of them and so few of us that we don't even make the effort to pray for them anymore, to help them out of their purgatory. This town is filled with echoes. It's like they were trapped behind the walls or beneath the cobblestones. When you walk, you feel like someone's behind you, stepping in your footsteps. You hear rustlings and people laughing, laughter that sounds used up and voices worn away by the years. It's about very real 
haunting um and it just it kind of gets you you know you're kind of reading it something happens something's revealed to you and it feels like kind of the floor drops out it makes you question your reality and it's just so cool i love books so much like this that work with memory a lot of these actually work with memory and trauma and all that stuff so this is absolutely number three like the top three again are so good like these are my books of the year so this is definitely definitely top three so good the top two these are really tied these are they're kind of tied but um i'm gonna put one above the other just because um i don't know the feeling the feeling so number two i'm gonna say is season of migration to the north wow this was a recommendation from you guys most of these probably were thank you so much once again i read this and i finished it and immediately i threw it in my boyfriend's face and i was like okay your turn again we've been talking about this book for so long this was my pick for sudan for my around the world challenge wow so we have this guy he leaves his home in sudan and he goes out to the united kingdom to get an education he comes back and things are different um the writing once again let me just point it out right away the writing is absolutely insanely gorgeous i love repetition i think it's something that is so cool to play around with that's why i loved it so much in dombey and sun but i love when it happens the blind owl is a good example untold night and day which made it onto this list last year um it becomes kind of like a premonition a mantra something to look out for something that becomes unsettling something that invades you like a rhythm or like the waves of an ocean which actually season of migration to the north has a lot to do with water as well and changing tides and stuff like that anyway he comes back and he meets this man named mustafa who i don't think he's ever seen before but he's like hey i'm like you i as well went to the united kingdom to get my education came back and things were really different for me things didn't go the way i thought they would and our unnamed narrator is like okay can you tell me your story and mustafa is like yeah but at what cost and he tells him his story most of this book is mustafa's story his time in london i think right after world war one um what happened to him in society it's a lot about sexual relationships it's a lot about obviously racism lionization because people are kind of of two minds when they meet him in london i think um so you follow that but the writing is just gorgeous and more than that it is a revenge story because mustafa after he experiences what he does in london is like i'm going to get revenge on western civilization western culture and western people um just literally magnificent so magnificent i felt as though a piece of ice were melting inside of me as though i were some frozen substance on which the sun had shone this is one of the lines that's repeated that oh my god Everything which happened before my meeting her was a premonition. Everything I did after I killed her was an apology. Not for killing her, but for the lie that was my life. I tell you, I can't tell you how- I want to read this. I want to read this again right now, reading those passages. I want to do so much more with this book because the first time I read it, I just annotated a lot and like tried to keep track of certain things. <gasps> Guys, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe this is number one. Okay, I don't know because the other book is Ice Fields by Thomas Wharton. This one is just very special, I think, to me on a personal level because it, it talks so much about nature and the mountains. Very, very different books. Um, this one is also a piece of eco-criticism, but Ice Fields. This this barged into both of these barged into my life but this one more so because i actually heard of this because someone gifted me molly of the mall which is a book about a girl it's like a kind of a rom-com coming of age and at the back of that book there were a list of other books published by the same canadian um company i think and icefield was one of them anyway i wrote icefields down in a journal just like thinking because it had ice in the title okay let's be real um so i wrote it down and i just hid it away and then i went to alberta for the first time saw mountains for the first time went into the bookstore that was in the hotel at lake louise and i saw this on the shelf and i wanted to buy a book in banff and this was the one that i bought did did not have any i thought i was gonna hate this book because it's historical fiction it seemed a little dry to me ice fields just like ripped open my being and stuffed ice in there um i can't tell you how much closer i've grown to love winter as a season it's just something that's so highly personal to me is this love for the cold and for ice and now for glaciers because not only did i get to see a mountain for the first time in my life this year i got to see a glacier in iceland and the whole time i was at that glacier i think the glacier was called solheimer yokel 
Um, this book was literally in my blood. I bawled my eyes out seeing that ice and I just think because I read this it made me appreciate so much more the ecosystem of our world and the parts that snow and ice and glaciers play in it. This is about a bunch of people obsessed with glaciers and every year they kind of come back to Jasper in Alberta and they stay near the Athabasca Glacier. I am planning a trip to Jasper in 2023, so clearly, clearly this book did things in my brain. It kind of follows our one man, Dr. Edward Byrne, and on an expedition at the start of this book, he falls into a crevice in the glacier, which is extremely dangerous. He goes unconscious, but while he's down there, he sees something in the ice, like preserved in the ice. Once again, I can't get this idea of things preserved in ice out of my mind. I don't know, it's it's something that haunts me forever. <laughs> Why? Can't really tell you. He sees something in there. It's very indistinct. Uh, it's not communicated really in a way that we can see as the reader, but he goes back obsessively to this spot, like maps it out because he's a scientist and he's like, I'm gonna wait until this thing melts because of course the glacier is retreating um, and I'm gonna be there when this thing emerges from the ice and the whole book you're like what like what is he seeing down there what is it you have different people who come and they all form relationships and they all share like their obsession for this part of the world um we have people who are obsessed with just the beauty of it we have people who come to write we have people who are forced to be there we have explorers mountaineers people who just want to make a profit off of it want to make ski resorts and lodges it's set at the time when tourism is becoming a thing in jasper and just so interesting but so beautiful it deals again with so much trauma um especially of course related to an accident in burden's case because you know he like he hit i don't know just so personal to me so personal to me in so many ways and so strikingly beautiful it's also so easy to read for a moment he could not believe in these hard unfathomable masses of rock they seem to hang suspended in the sky a quick cold breath might shatter them like an illusion of ice crystals and light squinting he picked out the crevices and ice falls of arcturus glacier from this distance, they seemed only delicate, spidery wrinkles in pale blue silk. Above them gleamed the white rim of the Neve, where the glacier spilled from a gap between the flanking peaks, a slender curve of burning snow. Also, this book taught me so much vocabulary about geology and glaciers, um, which I didn't know before, and now I do. This book is split also into different sections of like, I think the life, the lifespan of a glacier, and it just really made it something that is alive, like just because it's ice, like it became something living. And then like to associate kind of the different stages of a glacier with different periods in a person's life or like emotionally what is going on in the book, so impressive because we have like this section which is called the ablation zone, which is the firm line between the inviolate and the melting zones of the glacier. Uh, once past this point, the ice begins to die. Melting can be hastened by even a faint increase in heat at the lower extremity of a glacier, such as produced by the flash bulbs of hundreds of cameras. I just can't tell you how much I love the study of glaciers, man. Also, this quote that it starts with. Okay, I guess after that rant, this is my number one book of the year. It's Ice Fields. An experience, a truly transformative experience. A love story, truly a love story. And um, that's what your affairs with books are really truly supposed to be, so cool. Those are my best books of the year. Thank you so much for coming along with me on hopefully a not too long-winded rant. We're drinking coffee this time. No more alcohol for a little bit, I think, um, if you want to watch my worst books of the year. That was a time to be alive, or I tried to be alive. As always, so happy, so happy about all of these books. So if you have read any of them, please let me know your thoughts. I am going to go start reading for, I guess, 2023. I'm starting with A Farewell to Arms by Ernest Hemingway, so it should be a good way to start the year. And um, I will see you very soon in my next video. So until then, ciao.